I call your attention to the verse up on the overhead, 2 Samuel 22. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, thou dost save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Jan, one of our veterans, would you open our service in prayer, please? grace, Lord God, that you just shower upon us every day, Lord. So bless this service. Empower Pastor with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Help our hearts be open and our spiritual eyes open, Lord God, to hear what you have for us today. And just bless this time together. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Just some announcements, upcoming events. Today we have a taco fellowship lunch downstairs. Uh, we should have plenty of food, so come down and join us. Uh, following our lunch downstairs, we're just going to have a little question and answer time on James chapter 2. Uh, I remember back a month or so ago, I preached, I think, four messages on James 2, and so we just have a couple of informal questions to follow up on. Uh, but that's today downstairs. Uh, Bible school every morning, 945, children classes right on up through adults. And I just had a couple of pictures here of the little kids class. And, you know, it gets cute. Oops, wait a second here. I think I'm going to be able to, I think, let you listen in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Sing it again. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Doesn't get much better than that, does it? But uh, that is the uh, mission of our church, is to be teaching and preaching the Word of God from the little kids right on up. They learn the stories of the Lord Jesus and the, the truths of Scripture. Uh, serving, cleaning church this week, Burtners and Blessers. The Blessers are... Uh, we've had a couple of people have to uh, bow out of church cleaning for a while, and so that enables anyone who's not on the regular church cleaning schedule to fill in. So you can show up anytime this week and clean whatever you want. So uh, lawn mowing, we have the official, we're done. Snow shoveling, yeah, that's starting. So uh, men, there is a sign-up sheet on the little podium out there. You can get signed up on. Today's your last day if you want to get a, be a help in that area. Uh, next Sunday evening uh, is our Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, you can come about 5 o'clock, but we probably won't eat until about 5.30. But uh, try, to, try to aim to get here between 5 and 5.15 next Sunday evening. Um, and then bring, bring a word of testimony, a praise with you uh, to share. We're going to just have a great... And, and invite some more people too, okay? Uh, bring as many as you can. So, uh, December 3rd, Kids Night Out. No, parents night out, kids night in. We are going to host the kids here at the church. We'll have workshops and games and stuff for the kids to do. And that gives the parents uh, a couple hours of free time to be out uh, with, your, with your spouse and enjoy a little quiet time, maybe some shopping, maybe dinner or something. But uh, hopefully it'll be a blessing to both the parents and the kids. All right. Are there any other announcements? Uh, there is one, I'm sorry, and that is Sunday, December 11th, and that is our Christmas program for our kids. Our kids aren't going to be up front, but our kids have been working on a program for the last two or three months. They put together a phenomenal video, and you won't want to miss it. We saw this, the, the first showing of it, uh, was it last Sunday, well anyways, last week, and uh, it was, it's phenomenal. And so that's going to be Saturday, a Sunday evening service on uh, November 11th. 
no, December 11th, okay? I'm getting my months mixed up. But just want you to get that down in your, your date book, okay? So that's going to be great. All right, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 36, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We will stand as we sing. Number 36. seated thank you and you know all who wrote that song Martin Luther it was a great song coming out of the Reformation period somewhat five six hundred years ago five hundred and five years ago uh, so that was a great song before I get to that one other announcement and that is on the back uh, little podium on your way out there or the little table next to it there are some uh, memory verses and we would encourage you to grab one or both of these and resolve to hide God's word in your heart, okay? And uh, maybe you could just, maybe uh, half of the verses, whatever you think you can do, but um, between you and God, make it an effort to, to hide the word of God in your heart. All right, the reason we sang A Mighty Fortress is Our God is because we didn't sing it two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we had uh, October 30th, uh, Sunday, uh, Brother uh, Ralph Schessinger, our missionary, our national brother from Germany was with us, and we could have, should have sung it, but we didn't, 
It was also Reformation Sunday, the last Sunday in October. Uh, Reformation Sunday, uh, actually Reformation Day it was on the Monday, but the Sunday was Reformation Day. Um, that is a day that uh, we kind of look back and celebrate what that was accomplished in the Reformation. Uh, Baptists, as Baptists, we don't really celebrate it though. And the reason being is, is because what came out of the Reformation, we really were doing before the Reformation. Okay, The Reformation was the reforming of the Roman Catholic Church. And so the Reformers were people who were in the Roman Catholic Church, were coming out of the Catholic Church, trying to reform the Catholic Church. Well, Baptists weren't in that to begin with. So Baptists are not te technically um, Reformation churches. Um, but, but some of the great truths that came from the Reformation, we do celebrate. And we have always believed. And uh, let me just give you some of these lessons that came out of the Reformation. Uh, there's five primary teachings that were, were the reforming, okay, the, that were attempting at reforming the Catholic Church that had been lost over the last 1,200 years. And uh, so these were some of those teachings. By the way, uh, October 31st, 1517 is when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the uh, church door of the Wittenberg Castle and uh, kind of kicked off the Reformation period. But uh, these are what is known as the pillars of the Christian faith. There's five of them that came out of this sola scriptura. That means scripture alone. This is our sole authority. It's not church traditions. It's not angels. It's not saints. It's, it's God's word. That's our ultimate authority in everything. How we live, what we believe, what we practice, sola scriptura, sola Christo, by Christ alone. Our salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. We preach Jesus Christ crucified. Uh, Paul says, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why is that? Because that's the only way of salvation. Yeah, it, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus Christ alone. It's by grace alone. Salvation is a gift. It's not by works. It's not through penance. It's not through uh, rituals and ceremonies. It's, it's by grace alone. It's by faith alone. Faith is the vehicle. It's the conduit by which we receive God's gift of salvation. Again, uh, we don't work for it or earn it in any way. We simply believe uh, the, uh, the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe. John 3.16, that most familiar verse in the whole Bible, God so loved this world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Faith is the only means of salvation. And it's for the glory of God alone. Uh, everything is to be done to the glory of God, but our salvation in particular, God saves us for His own glory. Yes, there's a lot of benefits to us too. We, we are the benefactors, but uh, it is for ultimately for the glory of God alone. So those are what we call the five solas. Those are the pillars of the Reformation, and uh, they are what uh, the, these key truths that we believe and preach and teach. And uh, so we would say amen to what the Reformation accomplished. And uh, Lord willing, our church will always stand strong on those great truths. All right, we have our songs. Does everybody have a copy uh, in front of them of Keep On the Firing Line? Keep on the firing line. That means up front uh, where the danger is. The firing line is uh, up front to meet the enemies. And if you haven't noticed, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a Veterans Day theme to our service today. Yes, Veterans Day. Uh, but keep on the firing line. This is as soldiers of the Lord we're going to keep uh, up front and firing. Okay? <laughs>
catch your breath. <laughs> we're going to speed it up. No, we're not. <laughs> I'm already getting slow. My eyes are like three, three words behind. <laughs> All right, on the third verse. You may be seated. Thank you. And ushers, come and receive our Lord's tithes and offerings, please. And you can just stick those papers in your hymnal rack there so we have them again in the future. Stuart, would you ask God's blessing on our offerings? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and we thank, thank you for you. this time to gather together and worship you, Lord. We thank you that you've for all that you've given us, Lord, and we Thank you that you've given us this opportunity to give some of that back to you in faithful worship of you, Lord. We ask that you would bless these tithes and offerings and use them to serve your will. In your son's name, amen. Amen. in your hymn books 413 sound the battle cry and again if you're able stand with us to sing please 413 
Don't sit down. If you would remain standing, we're going to have Aubrey come and sing the national anthem at this time. sit down yet. There's a greater than the U.S. flag, and it's our Savior. The flag represents the Savior in whose kingdom it stands. So let's pledge allegiance to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty for all who believe. Amen. Now you may be seated. I'm proud of our country. I do not apologize for being an American or for being male or for being white. <laughs> Those are things that God did uh, by his providence and his sovereign control. Uh, I was birthed here in America in this time and place where I am, and I am proud of that. But uh, my allegiance to the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, is even a higher allegiance than that. Uh, some of you who know uh, the U.S. flag code um, might say there's something wrong with our flags up here. And that is because, according to the U.S. flag code, uh, when the flags are down on the floor where the people are seated, the U.S. flag should be to your right. But when they're on a platform, they are always, the U.S. flag is to be to the speaker's right. At our church, we've turned those around, no disrespect to our U.S. flag, but absolute, eternal, utmost respect for our Savior and His kingdom. That is our true allegiance. And, and so when I go to Haiti or Germany or Ghana or wherever I'm worshiping, we all worship alike under the Christian flag. So, we'll dismiss our children for Children's Church. That is ages 4 through 10, and we're a little flexible. Yeah, we're a little flexible, but 4 through 10. Well, Luann, you're a little old there. We're flexible, but not that flexible. Pastor, microphone. Ah, my microphone. Thank you, Mark. Oh, thank you. Well, I want to talk today, since it was Veterans Day Friday, and the birthday of the Marines, by the way, on Thursday, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to talk today uh, about manning up like a soldier. Uh, we honor our veterans uh, on Veterans Day, by the way. We have a Memorial Day. That's to remember all those who died. Veterans Day is to remember all who served. And uh, we honor and deeply, deeply appreciate all of those who served in our military, served our United States. Uh, I believe that our United States military ought to win the Nobel Prize Award every single year. Do you know that they keep the peace in this, in this world? Not just here in America to defend us, but they sail the seas and keep nations and people at bay and wars from breaking out all around the world 
day in and day out, our U.S. military. So continue to pray. Um, pray for our military people, those that are serving today, and, and always appreciate those who served in the past and gave us a great, great country, a land of freedom. And then it's upon us to do all we can to pray and preserve that. But I want to talk today about manning up like a soldier. So if you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul gives this command here. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave. Be strong. That word be brave, it's just one word. Um, and the old King James translates it, quit you like men. Quit you like men. Well, the word quit, we don't use that word anymore like that. We use the word quit like give up. Stop it. <laughs> But, but it's an archaic Old English word, and what it really meant back in 1600 when it was used was act. Act like something. Behave like something. And the idea was act like a man. Behave like a man. And so, so quit you like men doesn't mean don't stop being like a man. It means to act like a man. Be manly. And in the context, I think Paul is talking about courage and bravery to stand up to what is right, for what is right. Stand up against people who would seduce you to believe wrong things, false doctrines, to seduce you from the faith, from following after Christ. People who would hinder you from walking after Christ and obeying Christ. Don't, don't give in to them. Man up. Act like a man. Courage, boldness, not a wimpy crybaby, not a whiner, not a mamby pamby, panty waist. Man up! Act like a man. And, and by the way, this is for women and girls too. Have this manly trait of boldness, of courage, of determination, of resoluteness. To stand for Christ in the face of opposition. That's what Paul's talking about. And he says, man up. Quit you like men. Show yourself to be a man. That doesn't give you license to be a, a meanie. It doesn't give you license to push your wife around or intimidate your children or uh, be a jerk. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about being firm, standing on the truth. That's the manly trait he's talking about here. I know our world has perverted the idea of manliness. We have the idea of being macho. You know, if you lift weights, if you play football, if you, you know, you're, I don't know, something like that, that, that makes you a man. If you drive a Harley, you're a man. If you drive a monster truck, you're a man. If you don't have a monster truck or a Harley, then, then at least drive fast and reckless. That makes you a man. <laughs> I don't care what the law is. I do what I want. Man, I'm a man. I'm macho. Some people in some cultures, you know, if your pants hanging halfway down your butt, that makes you macho. It's not, but that's the way the people think. You know, oh yeah, I'm really tough. I'm a big man. I, speaking of being a big man, I just remembered back when I was in fourth grade. I think it was Newtown, Connecticut. And that's uh, when I first started walking home from school. And I just remember, we were lived about maybe two miles from school, not very far, but I remember carrying my books home. Yeah, fourth grader carrying books. But I remember I had them under my arm, like the high school kids did. And I just remember walking down the side of the street, you know, feeling like a man. All 58 pounds of me, probably. I just felt so grown up. I am walking home from school with my books under my arm like a man. I was really macho. And then, and then there was Michael Newman in fourth grade. I was pretty quick, and uh, on the playground I was really fast. And you know, in gym class we played dodgeball. I was able to jump over the ball and 
dodge, and I was pretty good in dodgeball, and so the kids in the class thought I was pretty good. Well, except there was this Michael Newman who was bigger and faster, I think. Anyways, everyone says, well, you've got to figure out who's tougher, you or Michael Newman. I go, no, that's all right. No, we've got to have a fight. You guys got to fight. Oh, why don't we just race? <laughs> Michael Newman, you see, was a pretty big fella. He was probably 100 pounds, and me, 58 pounds wet. And so anyways, the kids in the class, I mean, Michael and I were friends. It wasn't no big deal, but everybody wanted to know who was the tougher man, and so you got to fight. So after school Friday, on the way home from school, out behind the Grand Union, the Grand Union was our, our grocery store there in town, and uh, there was a, a pathway that went out behind the, school, the, the, the grocery store there. And so after school, behind the Grand Union, you and Michael. Michael Newman, 100 pounds of brawny muscle versus Timmy, 58 pounds, bag of bones. And I thought, oh, what in the world, but okay. So there must have been 15 kids gathering around and push you into the middle, you know. Okay. Who's going to stop? Who's got to watch? Who's got, you know, no one's got to watch. Well, I'll count. Okay. So I remember watching some of those old cowboy movies. And by the way, you know, this was back in the days, the early 60s of uh, Sonny Liston, Floyd Patterson, Cassius Clay. If some of you don't know Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali. Okay. So this was back in the day when boxing was a big thing. So anyways, I, I remember seeing some of those cowboy movies, you know, you got to duck, you know. So I was ready to duck first thing, you know, and he, Michael Newman swung, and I ducked. Of course, I fell flat on my face, and then he kicked me a few times. I got up. Uh, wait a second, time out. It wasn't pretty. How much time's left? Well, we've only counted to five. I said, okay. Well, then we started up again, you know, and I said, oh, I'm going <laughs> to, I jammed my nose right into his right fist. It, it didn't hurt him a bit. <laughs> Anyways, it wasn't pretty, and after a few minutes of this, I, I said, uh, wait a second, I, th I think we know who won. I got to get home. I got to get home for supper. <laughs> Michael Newman was the man, the champion of the fourth grade elementary school in New York, in uh, Connecticut. That wasn't macho, though. That wasn't, manliness is, is, is the courage to stand for Christ. A lot of people think they're manly and they don't have the guts to stand up for what is just right, morally right. I know we live in a day and age where all around us things are legal, but it's immoral. Things are approved and accepted by society, but they're immoral. They're wrong. God calls us to a life of righteousness and holiness and purity, and it takes a man, courage, boldness, determination to stand up and do what's right. That's what soldiers are made of. Quit you like men. Over to 2 Timothy, if you would, chapter 2. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Verses 3 and 4. Paul calls upon Timothy. Paul's the elder. He's calling upon young Timothy. And he says this in verse 3. Timothy, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare, that is, no one serving as a soldier in active combat, nobody in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life in order that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So Paul said in 1 Corinthians, man up, act like a man. The boldness, the courage, the determination, the fortitude to stand and do what's right. Here he says to Timothy, you've got to endure hardship. Because that's part of the, the soldier's life, isn't it? Hardship. There's, there's a conflict, there's agony, there's deprivation, there's self-discipline, there's, there's things you go without when you're in combat. And that's what he says, you've got to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And it just reminds us that we are in a battle. Yes, God has called us to be His sons, and we enjoy that, to be the sons of God, to be the children of God. He's called us to be saints, to be holy, separate. He's called us to be servants, to labor and serve for Him. 
but he also calls us soldiers because in this world we are in a spiritual battle against the world and against the flesh and against uh, Satan and demonic forces, against ungodliness and irreligious people and uh, wickedness in this world. And, and we have to be soldiers. And he says, you're going to have to endure hardship. And then he reminds us in verse 4 that no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of life. to get caught up, to entwined in the affairs of life. Well, we, we live in this world, and so there are the affairs of life. I mean, we have to get up and go to work, and, and uh, we have to pay our, our, our taxes, and we pay our bills, and, and we mow our lawns, and there's things we do in this life. Part of the affairs of this life. But, and those aren't wrong to do those things, but he says that as a soldier, we can't get entwined in them tangled up in them, obsessed with them. Remember, God calls upon Christians to be moderate in all things. Moderation. Not obsessed, not, not taken up, and not inundated with these things. Facebook is fine. Smartphones are fine. <laughs> they can become addictive, can't they? can't they? And they rob us of our time. So many things in this life can rob us of time and energy that God says, you're a soldier. You're going to be serving me. You're here. You've been, you've been drafted, mustered, um, conscripted. I don't know what you call it. But God has called us to be soldiers in His army. And uh, we can't afford to be wasting our time, energy, and money getting entangled with the affairs of this life. Remember the parable in Luke, I um, can't even remember what chapter is, I think it's chapter 8, but Luke, the Lord Jesus was given the parable of the sower and the seed. The sower went out and he sowed for seed. And God says, well, that seed is the word of God. And it goes out and that seed was landing on different kinds of soil. There were four different kinds of soil. And uh, there was the rocky soil and then there was this kind of soil. And, then, and anyways, there was a one where, where when he was sowing, the seed landed uh, among thorns. It was kind of like, over in the side bushes there, landed among the thorns, and the thorns rose up, and it says it choked it out. So it brought no, no fruit. And, and so later in the description of the explanation, the Lord Jesus says that that which fell in among the thorns was that which rose up, and then the pleasures and the cares of this life choked it out. The pleasures and cares... The same thing. And by the way, that, that person there in, in that situation, now on that ground, he wasn't a Christian. It wasn't a saved person. Because the Word of God got choked out by the affairs of this life. And, and we have to be careful as a, as a soldier that there's a single-mindedness, a, a, a focus, a goal, a mission to our lives. And it's not to make this world our home. We're just a passing through. We're pilgrims. And yes, we are in the affairs of this life, but don't get entangled and in bondage to them. Endure the hardship. Then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you go over there, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And by the way, you remember, this is the last book the Apostle Paul ever wrote. Uh, Paul was uh, in prison at the time he wrote this. And uh, this was his second imprisonment, if not his third. But this is where his life ends. And chapter 4 is the last few words that Paul ever penned. And in fact, uh, it may be just a matter of minutes before he was beheaded, executed. And he says this in verse 5, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. He says, again, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, But you, be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. You see, interesting, that word endure afflictions, it's the exact same word as he used before where it said endure hardships. Here it's translated affliction. Same, exact same word. There's hardships, there's afflictions when you're serving Christ. They're inevitable. This warfare that we're in, by the way, we didn't start it, we didn't want it, we didn't ask for it, but it's inevitable. In the Christian life, a Christian in this world, it's going to be a is going to stand alone. He's going to, there's going to be conflict, affliction, and hardships. And so Paul tells him again, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. 
The work of an evangelist, by the way, is, is the gospel. Preach the gospel, the good news. Invite people to saving faith in Christ. Fulfill your ministry. Make, or, or literally, the King James, make full proof of your ministry. Serve your ministry. The word is there, diakonos, to serve fully. Don't skimp. Don't lessen it. Don't skimp on those things. You're here to serve the Lord and do it fully. With all your might, heartily. Fulfill your ministry, whatever God has called you to. But you're here to serve Him. And then Paul says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering here in prison. I'm being poured out as a libation and offering. I'm, my life is being given up here now. And the time of my departure is at hand. Uh, Paul says, I'm, I'm about ready to be executed. The, uh, the, the guy's at the door waiting for me. He says, I have fought the good fight. He says, I've, I've, been, I've been a soldier. I've done it. He says, now Timothy, it's your turn. I've, I've, I've kept the faith, he says. Notice that? I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Back in uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 24, when Paul was meeting with the Ephesian elders and he was leaving, and uh, he knew he was going and probably going to be arrested and, and what was all going to happen to him, but he says, but none of these things move me. In other words, none of these things are going to deter me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy, my race with joy, and the ministry which I have received to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says, nothing's going to deter me from finishing that course. And now, years later, we come and here he's in prison. He's about to be executed. And he says, yeah, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I've kept the faith. I stood as a soldier of Christ. I was resolute, determined, brave, bold. I did it. Timothy, now you need to do it. There is a time for Christians to fight, by the way. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians and churches are just bickering and gossiping and name-calling each other. That's not what we're talking about. That's not good fighting. Fighting with your spouse never ought to happen. That's not good fighting. When Paul talks about the good fight, he's talking about the spiritual warfare he has with the world and the devil and the demons and false doctrine. It means when he's acting as a good soldier, standing firm, standing on righteousness, doing what's right in the face of evil. Doing what's right even though it's unpopular, even though it's inconvenient, even though the world frowns on it. He's going to do what's right. He says, I've done it. I fought. Matter of fact, the word fought and fight come from the same word. It's the word agonizomai, agonize. We get our English word agonize from it. I agonized the good agony. I agonized. Because it was a fight, a conflict. The word agony actually has the idea. It's both a military term and an athletic term. It was used in the athletic arena for two wrestlers or two boxers uh, going at it. The contest, the conflict. And they were agonizing in this conflict against their adversary. It's used in the military too. It's used in our personal lives when we agonize and fight to do what's right. And Paul says, I agonize the good agony. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. My course is nearing an end. I'm still standing, still standing strong for Jesus Christ, still believe the same old book and old faith that I did when I came here some 43 and a half years ago. But my race is nearing an end. And now it's up to some of the young godly men in our church to take on the mantle of serious ministry. Stuart and Curtis and David and Brandon and Will, Joel, Andrew, Joshua. We have some godly men in our church. Young men. We've got some middle-aged men that are wonderful too. We've got some older men. That are, but I'm talking about these young men. And I would say to you, as Paul did to Timothy, get ready to endure hardship as a good soldier. And don't get entangled in the affairs of life. 
the young age there, it's so easily to get our minds set on a career and money and, and home and different things of this world. And I would say, no, get your mind focused back on what God has called you. This world is, you're just passing through. You're a soldier, you're a servant, you're a son of God. And there's an eternal kingdom that awaits you. Get focused. But Paul says, I've done it. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and this is just another example of Paul saying, I did it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul says, I did it, you can do it. He says in verse 1, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our heart. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. So Paul says, here's my example. Yes, I, I have fought the good fight. I finished my course. I, I, I did it. And Timothy, it's up to you now. And then he writes to this church at Thessalonica. And he says, for you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. In other words, it wasn't useless, profitless, <laughs> good for... No, in fact, it was just the opposite. Paul's ministry in Thessalonica was dynamic, powerful demonstration of the Word of God and in the power of the Spirit and people were saved and their church was established. God worked. He says this in verse 2, even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi. This, this isn't the first time I got mistreated. Remember back in Philippi? Paul and Silas ministering, and this lady with the de demon possessed lady was following around, and, and Paul cast the demon out of her. And their ma her masters, that were making a lot of money off her divination, they weren't too happy about this, and they dragged them, Paul and Silas, down to the marketplace before the magistrates. And uh, they stripped them, they beat them with rods, put them in shackles in the inner prison. By the way, this picture here, there's actually light in this dungeon. It wasn't this nice. <laughs> they were stripped. They were humiliated. They were beaten to a pulp, basically. When you were beaten with rods, uh, it was... In fact, the beating that they took with rods was not even allowed. It was an ignominious... Just like crucifixion, you know, the crucifixion wasn't for Roman citizens because it was too, too disgraceful for any Roman citizen. And same with this flogging with these rods. It was, a, it was, it was reserved for the most vile, low-down, good-for-nothing scoundrels that got beat with these rods. And uh, that's how they treated Paul and Silas. And in fact, there in Acts chapter 16, verse 35 to 39, uh, when, they, when they finally came and sent word back, oh, you better let them go because they're Roman citizens, Paul, Paul says, no, I want the magistrates to come down here themselves and apologize. You violated my Roman citizenship. Paul understood our dual citizenship and our responsibilities on earth as well as to God in heaven. We pay taxes to Caesar and we render unto God the things that are God's. But anyways, Paul had Roman citizenship and he was abused physically, um, insulted, disgraced, thrown in prison. And that's what he says here. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, well, you'd heard about that. You knew all about that. What'd we do? Well, we limped on down the road about 100 miles, five-day journey by foot, and they finally came to Thessalonica. What did they do? Limped into town, beaten, broken, bruised. We're going to take a time out. We're going to... We need to rest up, recuperate for a couple months. Uh, we'll be down by the spa, you know, and 
We're going to get, uh, you know, just some time off, rethink this ministry stuff. We, you know, we get beat up and insulted like this. We don't want to do this anymore. No, that's not what they did. Even after they got pulverized in Philippi, walked five days to Thessalonica, we were bold in our God to speak to you. Bold. I'd have sort of cut down my message a little bit, maybe not been so bold. Maybe, uh, I pray to God I wouldn't have been. I, but humanly, I think I would have been afraid to speak out quite so boldly. But Paul did the exact same thing, preached the exact same message with boldness. Where in the world does that boldness come from? You notice there, it says bold in our God. Paul wasn't a raving maniac. He wasn't a wild man driven by emotion and revenge and anger and pride. No, his boldness was in God. God is my confidence. God is the one who imbues me with strength to go on. And that's what he said, boldness in our God. And it reminded me how the disciples in the early book of Acts, how they prayed. Remember when Peter and John got arrested, thrown in prison, they got released? What did they do? The first thing, they came back to their people and told them all things, told them what everything that happened. And the people went to praying. And they didn't say, Lord, protect us, stop this persecution. No, they prayed, Lord, look on their threats and kill them, silence them. No, just give us boldness. Grant, it's a gift from God. Grant to your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word. He just prayed for greater boldness. And that's what Paul said. Here's another uh, military context, by the way. Romans chapter, or Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Stand like a man, like a soldier. In the fa having your, girds, lo your, your, your loins girded about with truth and your breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of God, all that. And then he says in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. The most important part of the armor of God is prayer. And he says, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And pray for me too, Paul says. And what does Paul want him to pray for? That utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth with boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. He's in prison when he's writing this. And he says, "Give me, pray for more boldness for me to preach, that I may make, speak boldly as I ought to speak. So boldness to speak, it comes from God. We pray for boldness. Maybe that's what we need to be doing. I know we pray for Aunt Nellie to get better and so-and-so's sprained knee and so-and-so's got surgery and so-and-so's got COVID and we pray for all these sick people. You know what we really need to be praying for? Boldness. To stand for Christ in the workplace. Stand for Christ in the marketplace. Stand for Christ in our neighborhood. Do what's right. He says, we were bold to speak, bold in our God to speak to you, what? The gospel of God. That's his message is the gospel. People need to hear the good news. We're in a world, we're in a desperate world that needs some good news. We've got the good news. We've got the good news about a God who so loved this world, He sent His Son to be a Savior. We've got the gospel news that talks about Jesus Christ who left heaven's glory and took on humanity so that He could be our substitute at Calvary. He went to Calvary and He took our sin upon Himself. He bore our sin. He paid the debt. The wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus. That was me. That was my sin. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe because I owed a debt I could not pay. And he procured my salvation there at Calvary. That's the good news. And salvation is to any who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul also calls it the gospel a couple times in this chapter. He calls it the, my gospel sometimes. In, the, in chapter 1, he calls it our gospel. He says, it's my gospel because I believe it. It's mine. God's revealed it to me. God saved me. It's my gospel. It's my gospel because I believe it. I stand on it. I obey it. I'm going to defend it. It's our gospel. It belongs to the saints, to those who are believers. It's your gospel. Do you believe it? I hope you do. And I hope you're willing to defend it and stand for it. It's the gospel of God because it's God's truth. 
God revealed it. It's God's way of salvation. There's no other. It's the gospel, the good news from God and of God. And that's what Paul was bold to speak. But you know, as he goes on, he says, we're bold to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. So not only did they suffer there in, in Philippi where they were thrown in prison, but five days later they traveled down to Thessalonica and start preaching. And he says it was in much conflict here also. Agony, that's the word again. Agonizing. Yes, we were preaching, we were bold to preach. But there was more conflict, and you can read about it in Acts chapter 17 there. Evil men stirred up the people in the marketplace, and they dragged them and beat them, and what a mess. And so they go on down to Berea, south of Thessalonica. They go on down to the next town. To get away? No. To boldly preach the word again. And you know what happened? When the people in Berea, the unbelievers, heard... They, they, or the people in Thessalonica, the unbelievers there, they came on down to Berea and stirred up trouble. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, you know, you know my manner of conduct, you know my doctrine, you know my long-suffering, you know my afflictions, you know my persecutions at uh, Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. <laughs> oh, those weren't even these. And we know also Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. You know what? Everywhere Paul went, he preached the gospel. And everywhere he went, there was trouble, conflict. To be a soldier, it's conflict. That's why he calls us endure hardness, endure hardship, endure the conflict. Be a man. Man up. Stand up. Do what's right. Fulfill your ministry. Preach the gospel. Don't be a mamby-pamby. That won't cut it. You need something more than a cotton string for a backbone if you're going to be a Christian. And then he says in 2 Timothy 3.12, he says, yes, and all who will live godly, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I'm not just talking about pastors and preachers and missionaries wherever they go. I'm talking about the regular old Christian who wants to live like Christ called them to live. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be conflict. Because this is a fallen, broken world. And this world doesn't agree with your moral absolute standards. It doesn't agree with God's. And they hated God, they hated Christ, they crucified Him, and they're not going to care much for you either. The Marines got the slogan, first to fight. I'm not dissing any of the other military branches here, but uh, the military, uh, the, the Marines got that name uh, from some gunnery sergeant who ended up dying in Iwo Jima. And uh, there was a book written about that, but it came from the military practice of sending the Marines in first. Uh, there was some indomitable spirit of fighting in them, and uh, they, by land or by sea, they were sent in. By the way, it was the Second Continental Congress that uh, began the Marines, November 10th, 1775. But I would call upon you as Christians to have that same spirit. Uh, yeah, in this world, unbelieving world, sinful world, broken world, it's not going to agree with you. Stand for Christ no matter what. Amen. Endure hardship. Endure conflict. Uh, and when we talk about fighting the good fight, I'm not talking about being cantankerous, being argumentative, stirring up controversy. I'm just talking about being adamant and firm, resolute in your stand for Christ and what is right. We do it as graciously and kindly as we can, but we do it as firmly. We don't ever compromise our principles. We don't compromise our standards. We don't compromise God's truth ever. U.S. Marine Corps, you can join now and test your courage. I say if you want to become a Christian, it will test your courage. It takes a real man. Quit you like men. Be brave. Be strong. 
when you trusted Christ as your Savior, basically you did take a pledge of allegiance. You don't really need to redo it because when you trusted Christ and surrendered your life to Him, you really said, okay, I'm, I'm joining the ranks. I'm going to be your child. I'm going to be your servant. I'm going to be your son. I'm going to be your soldier. You were enlisted as a soldier in the army of the King of Kings. Now it's just up to us to live like it. Heavenly Father, as we think of our veterans, we give you thanks, Lord, for our country, for those who protected it over the years, who served, who sacrificed, who gave of their time and their energy, gave part of their life, gave their health, gave their minds to serve our country. And, and we thank you for that. We thank them for that and we honor them. But this morning we're thinking of a greater, a greater mission, and that is the cause of Jesus Christ. You've called us to be your soldiers. You've called us to man up, to be bold, to be firm, courageous, to endure hardship and affliction, to endure persecution, to be bold in proclaiming truth. And so, Father, we would just call upon you to give us that boldness. As Paul did, praying with all prayer and supplication for all saints and for me. Give us boldness, Lord, that we may speak as we ought to speak. We'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, take your hymn books and turn to number 377. We're going to sing just the first two verses. on the first verse. Gary, another one of our great veterans, would you dismiss us in prayer? And again, just remind everybody, they'd like to have you join us downstairs for fellowship lunch. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the admonition uh, that you provided this day. We come to your house with expectation that we would be fed, that we would be challenged. And right, we saw you supplied even that. But Father, we would admit, each one of us, that perhaps the greatest fight that we wore each day is with our own flesh. Mm -hmm. And that uh, we know that it demands supremacy. 
but the Lord is the king of our heart and there's no room for any other. So Lord, we pray that you would encourage us in the fight against that which wars against your spirit. And Lord, even in that, we pray that you would grant us grace to love one another despite the flaws we see day in and day out. We give you all the praise and ask you all your great blessings on the fellowship that remains today. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name and his alone. Amen. Amen. Amen.